Hey, hey, hey! Welcome to the lecture on the skeletal system. This lecture is designed to help you with the second exam in uh, Anatomy 201. I want to say, first of all, this um, the test that you're going to take, the, the second exam that you're going to take, consists of a little bit of integumentary questions and a lot of skeletal system questions. So don't forget to study the integumentary system. There are questions from the integumentary system on the exam. However, the majority of the questions are going to come from the skeletal system. So really, really study this. And I'll say this again at the beginning of the lab video, but... Uh, I always tell students, memorizing the bones and bone markings is not hard. Memorizing is not hard. We've been doing it since we were in kindergarten, memorizing our address and phone number. However, memorizing the bones and the bone markings is a lot to memorize. I mean, it you're, you will be overwhelmed at the amount of information you've got to learn. And so keep telling yourself, this isn't hard, it's a lot. I've got to invest the time. Um, to you can make a hundred on this exam if you study early and often the biggest problem is that students say I ran out of time I didn't have enough time to study it all like I should and so um, as you go through the skeletal system and, and really the lab exam learning the bone markings but as you go through the skeletal system just remind yourself you can do this you've just got to do it um, and I always tell students, if getting a college degree was easy, they'd be passing them out like candy, and they're not. Getting a college degree requires a lot of work, a lot of money, a lot of time, uh, and in the end, it will be totally worth it. So keep your head up. Let me know if you've got any questions. Just email me. I'll help you. Um, I'll work with you any way that I can. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Skeletal system, I said it's hard, or I said it's a lot, actually. But it's really one of my favorites. And so I think you're going to love learning all about the bones. Okay, so um, bones are the organs of the skeletal system. So bone skeletal system uh, composed of tissues. And we already know about the osteoblast or the, um, the, the bone tissue, right? Cartilage, dense connective tissue, blood, and there's even some some nerves running through it. Okay, so highlight what uh, it says bones are alive and multifunctional. So what do they do? They support and protect. They provide the, the muscles attached to the bones. And so as the muscles flex, what do they move? They move the bones. So provide points of attachment. House the blood producing cells. So it's the neatest thing. And some of the bones are hollow. And inside those hollow bones, there's cells that make blood. So it's, it's like your stem cells that will become your red blood cells and white blood cells. Neatest thing ever. So they're inside the bone. And they also store inorganic salts like calcium. But go ahead and highlight that. You may see a question like, which of the following is not a function of the bone? So that's the function of the bones. Okay. Parts of a long bone. So you definitely want to look at this picture real close. You may see this picture on the test. So, and it'll be matching just like that. So pay good attention to it. So definitely pay close attention to that. And now the picture is labeled. Okay, so uh, the epiphysis is the end of the lone bone. And so you'll that's just the two ends. Nothing fancy there. Okay, the epiphyseal disc is responsible for bone growth in length. So highlight that. Responsible for bone growth in length. Okay, look right here. And you'll see on the picture it's labeled epiphyseal plates. Same thing. So you see that little line right there? I'm going to circle it, but then I'll erase it. That How it is a little bit lighter in those two spots. So that's the epiphyseal plates or epiphyseal disc. And what that if that's there, that means the bone is still growing in length, not diameter, in length. And so um, if you looked at a five-year-old's, this is the leg bone femur, they would have a large epiphyseal disc. But, you know, I'm 30. If you looked at mine... My is probably not there. You probably can't see it. My femur is not getting any longer. And so that's like your growth plate. I think you've heard that before. Okay, diapiphysis 
So let's erase that. Okay, diapiphysis, the shaft of the long bone. So that's all, this the whole long part. That's how long it is. The periosteum, okay, that's going to be, look right here at this one. Right there. That's that little piece of tissue around the bone. If you've ever been eating uh, chicken wings or something, you can, when you get down to the bone, you can scratch it and you can feel there's a little piece of tissue that wraps around the bone and it's called the periosteum. And so you definitely want to highlight that one too. And again, this picture, you may see this picture as matching on the exam, on the written exam, not the lab exam, but the written exam. And this whole PowerPoint video is designed to help you on the written exam. Okay, parts of a long bone. So still looking at that, you got compact bone. Uh, that's going to be this part right here, the hard part, the part that's not the whole, so the the round part. Um, tightly packaged tissue found in the diapiphysis, that's the long part of the bone. Uh, the spongy bone, that's going to be inside here. So if you look where I drew that purple, that's it looks like a spider web kind of. And then the medullary cavity, it's a large cavity within, I guess that's not out yet, within the diapiphysis and and that's filled with yellow marrow and every time I see this picture I always think uh, if you I have dogs you can buy those bones at um, the pet store and but you can't see the spongy bone on the inside you can just see the compact bone and so I don't know I guess it's been removed or whatever but anyway my dogs love to chew on those little things Okay, so there you can see the compact bone. Um, do me a favor, write this in. Over here where it says the osteon, write in the osteon. There we go, right there. Osteon is around the central canal. So you can see that from the picture. Of compact bone. Good, so if you look at the picture you can see the osteon right there in the middle is around the central canal and the central canal that's where the blood vessels are. So bone has to have nutrients and oxygen just like muscles or just like skin. Uh, to think about the skin that we just talked about. So the, the osteon is what makes the central canal so that blood vessels can deliver nutrients and oxygen. So it's pretty important. Okay, still looking at that long bone. Endosteum, that's going to be a membrane inside. So that lines the diapiphysis inside the bone. Um, articular cartilage, composed of thin cartilage. It's on the ends of the epiphysis. And so if you go back, look at the picture, you can see it. Um, looking at this picture right here, you can actually see the articular cartilage. That's what articulates with another bone, right? So it's the cartilage on the cap that articulates with another bone. And then the inside lining, that tissue, so not the, the periosteum is around, P-E-R-I, is around the outside. Endosteum, right there, is N-E-N-D-O, inside the long bone. Okay, next slide. And this is the neatest thing that the book talks about. Uh, it's talking about how the embryo develops. And I just think it's so amazing that we can grow these bones. But anyway, uh, the bone development in 14 weeks. So it just says the, the intramembraneous ossification. That means the, the skull is flat. The, the flat bones in the skull are still forming, so it's like a soft, you know how babies have like a soft spot, and you can see it in that picture, um, the intra in between the membrane, so in between the bones there's like a really, really soft tissue, okay, endochondrial ossification, the long bones and most of the skeleton are forming, and they actually, they actually start out as the hyaline cartilage, and so eventually the hyaline cartilage is replaced and becomes bone, but uh, I just think that's really neat. And so this next slide kind of goes into a little more detail. 
Okay, with the intermembranous bones, so the ossification is replaced and now it's bones. Uh, originate within sheet-like layers of connective tissue. It, it becomes bone, so it was just kind of soft tissue, but now it's bone. And then examples include the bones in the skull, and we're going to talk more about those. You'll know all about them by the end. Okay, highlight this part. Intramembranous ossification, the process of replacing embryonic connective tissue to form the bones. So the word ossification means that the bone is growing. So it's uh, the tissue is being replaced by bone. And so uh, on that last slide, I wrote in on my notes cranial bones. So you do the same so that in case you see that, you'll know. Okay, and this just shows you a picture of it. How It actually starts from the center, which I think is also very neat. And then it, it works its way out to become bone. So you can see on the far left, that's the ossification center. And then in the, the second picture, you can already see there's bone in the middle. So newly calcified bone matrix. Okay, on the endochondral bones... Um, they begin as hyaline cartilage. We already highlighted that. Most bones of the skeleton are this way, so the long bones. Femur, that's in your leg. Humerus, that's your arm. Radius, also that's the lower part of your arm. So those bones. And then endochondral ossification, process of replacing the hyaline cartilage to become bone. So the, the word ossification means the cartilage is becoming bone. Oppositional growth is responsible for the increase in diameter. So it, it's, it's growing out. Oppositional growth is responsible for the increase in diameter. So this is a picture out of the textbook. It just shows the bone as it forms. Um, remember that epiphyseal plate. We already highlighted it um, and on some other slides. But the epiphyseal plate, if you need to write it in, that means the bone is growing in length. So you can see, let's look at it in the picture right here, how the epiphyseal plate is really large there. And then that's that white part. And then as you grow, it's really small. So the epiphyseal lines or epiphyseal plates get smaller. And these words we're going to look at on the next slide. Okay, that bone, the, there's three types, uh, three cell types involved in bone growth. Okay, so the first one you definitely want to highlight, osteoblast, bone-producing cells. The bone can continue to grow in length as long as cartilage cells of the epiphyseal plate remain active. Okay, so here's what you want to know, that blast, B-L-A-S-T, is a suffix that means the bone is growing, is being created. Okay, so it's still developing. Okay, osteocyte, that's just a bone cell. It's, it's, uh, it's made from the osteoblast. It's, it can maintain healthy bone tissue. Okay, and then osteoclast is actually breaking down. Well, why would we want to break down? Clast is a suffix that means breakdown. Blast means develop. So they're opposite. Um, and, and I always tell this, uh, especially females, but everyone, we are, you know, the first few years of life, our mama is giving us milk and making sure we have lots of calcium so that we do what? So that we grow strong bones. And then after that, we start making our own nutritional choices. And if you don't have enough calcium, you have to have calcium to flex every muscle. You have to have calcium in the blood. So every... We need calcium all the time. And if you don't have enough, you're not taking enough in in your diet, then what's going to happen? Your body is going to break down bone to get it. If you've got to have calcium to flex the heart muscle, which you do, and you didn't take any calcium that day, eat any calcium, then your bones are going to give it up. And so, and that's why as we get older, our bones become more fragile. So if you're not, if you don't have a diet that has calcium in it, you need to be taking a supplement. And they make gummy vitamins. They're delicious. Anyway, that's my spill about calcium. Okay, so what affects bone growth? Nutrition, you've got, we've got to have a well-rounded diet. And when I say well-rounded, I mean fats, carbs, 
proteins. You know, we've, we've got to have it all. You, in my opinion, you should never have a diet that completely cuts out fats or completely cuts out carbs or, you know, nobody ever says cut out protein. But whatever. If you're a vegetarian, you got to get protein from, you know, nuts and things like that. You, you've got to have a well-rounded diet, especially during development, but even maintaining. Sunlight, yes, there is a reason we're laying in the sun. It's good for our bones. Minimal, minimal sunlight, of course. There's hormones. There's a hormone that's released in the brain, in the pituitary gland specifically, called growth hormone, and it helps you grow. And then physical exercise will actually make your bones more dense. And so, and and we say it's weight bearing exercises. And so, go to the gym, lift weights your whole life, and as you get older, your bones will be more dense, not fragile and stickly. Okay. What does vitamin D do? Vitamin D is uh, necessary to absorb the calcium from the intestine. So you got to have vitamin D. Um, it's, you know, especially you get it from milk, but you also get it from sunlight. Insufficient vitamin D in children causes what we call rickets. I like that. I believe I believe that might be a question on the test. I can't remember, but okay. Insufficient vitamin D in adults causes osteomalacia and that's softening of the bones um, as a result of calcium depletion and so that's going to be you know osteoporosis where the bones are fragile porous okay vitamin C so this is still what affects bone growth uh, is necessary for collagen and that collagen is a protein that's uh, structural so it's what makes your skin strong and things your not be able to see cellulite and not have wrinkles, whatever. Okay, so vitamin C is necessary for collagen synthesis by cells that form bones, osteoblasts. Lack of vitamin C may inhibit bone development. You have skinny bones, and we don't want that. We want good thick bones. In children and adults, a deficiency in vitamin C can result in scurvy, which is just porous bones uh, that aren't straight and teeth may even fall out so yeah no 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 okay hormones we already said are important for bone growth highlight for me growth hormones secreted by the pituitary gland i just said this it just wasn't in the words so highlight that for sure um, also the thyroid makes a hormone thyroid hormone stimulates replacement of cartilage and so the thyroid helps to maintain your calcium. So, but for sure, no growth hormone. And here's just some more functions. Of course, the bones give you shape and support and protect. The muscles attach, so it aids in movement. It's got the, the red blood cells uh, inside. And that, to me, is just so interesting that our bones have... Some of our bones are hollow. And the cells that are going to become blood cells are inside and we call that bone marrow so that's the liquid inside the long bones and of course they store inorganic salts okay we got two kinds of marrow red and yellow red is what we care about so much okay red marrow functions in the formation of hematopoiesis so how like that H-E-M-A means blood. So anytime you see a word that has H-E-M-A in it, you'll know that that means blood. So that is the process of blood forming. Okay, so y'all, this is the coolest thing to me. Inside the bones, you have this liquid and it's cells. But this the cells are not yet red blood cells or white blood cells or platelets. They're not that yet. They're going to become red blood cells. So that's what we call a stem cell. And so it's not on the test, but I want you to know it for life so that you can make decisions. But a stem cell is a cell that is not specialized. Okay. It could potentially I 
I should have put potentially in there. It could potentially become any cell type. So what that means is it's your cell. It's got your DNA. But it's not like a red blood cell or it's not a muscle cell or a liver cell. It's just your cell. It's like a blank. It's, uh, it's, it's an immature cell. That it's kind of like you before you got to college. You haven't just chose your major yet. You're a college student, but you're not. You don't have a major. You could become any kind. You could be a nurse or a lawyer or a teacher or, you know, work on cars. You could do anything. And so that's what a stem cell is. And so we get stem cells. We can get stem cells from our lung bones, but they're also in some other places. Um, the ones in the lung bones are average. It's like somebody already got to them and told them what they needed to major in. They needed to major in red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets. That's what causes clots in the blood. And so they're they're good, but they're not amazing because they've already they've already been um influenced, we'll say. They've already kind of they've already thought about their major. They think they're going to, you know. But there's some other places we can get stem cells, which is not in the notes or on the test, but I still want to tell you. Um, we can get stem cells from the umbilical cord. Now, our umbilical cord is gone. Our mamas threw it away. She didn't know how valuable it was, so she just threw it away. But there's these amazing stem cells in the umbilical cord, and they could potentially really become a liver cell or a heart cell or a muscle cell or a bone cell or a skin cell, you know, maybe even a nerve cell. And so, uh, if you were, if you think about it, if you were to have, let's just say, um, your pancreas doesn't secrete insulin like it, like it should, so you have diabetes type one, we could make you some new pancreatic cells that function appropriately, it cure diabetes if we had them, if it was legal. Um, if you had, if you needed a heart valve and you, you know, the transplant you couldn't get on the transplant list. Well, we could take your stem cells and grow you a new heart valve because your heart valves are made out of your cardiac cells. And so, neatest thing ever. But the long story short, in 1996, I believe it was, um, they took these stem cells and they cloned a sheep. And it, I can remember it. I, I'm probably older than a lot of you. But I can remember it happening and my mom was like, man, it's such a big deal. They cloned a sheep. Of course, I didn't care. And it was a baby sheep. And it didn't last long. Um, maybe, it, it lasted maybe seven years or something like that. It didn't, it didn't live, you know, a full lifespan of a sheep. But the fact that they cloned a sheep and it was born a baby and it grew up but it had identical DNA to its parent. It was it was just amazing that they did that. You know, didn't take a sperm and an egg. They took and cloned it. But at that time, the the government was like, whoa, 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 whoa. We were studying stem cells, making heart valves and stuff, making skin, and somebody made a sheep, pumped the brakes, cut all federal funding. I believe it was George Bush. Cut all federal funding. Stop, stop, stop. There'll be no more stem cell research and so that's where the controversy comes in with stem cell research and slowly uh, as the new presidents have come into office they've they've allowed minimal very controlled stem cell research and so we really don't know all of what we could do with stem cells and and they're learning every day and so um, now you can actually harvest the umbilical cord stem cells for your child if you it costs a lot of money but and, and that way, if they ever needed their stem cells, they could have them. But, so, back to stem cells just in general. You can get stem cells from lung bones, what's on the test. You can get stem cells from the umbilical cord. And then you can also get stem cells from aborted babies, which is the, another area of um, concern or controversy. But, if you look at the benefits, and you can also look at the the disadvantages and the scariness of cloning and and abortions, um, you, now hopefully you can make a wiser decision when you vote for um, different things in the political world. Are you for stem cell research or against stem cell research? Because I think the pros and cons are very obvious. And now you can make a decision there. Okay, yellow mara stores fat. Who cares about fat? It's not yuck. Anyway. 
Okay, so this red marrow, where can we get it from and the, what bones can we get it in? Okay, the two I want you to really know about. You can get them from the pelvic. That's what the picture's showing you. But you can also get it from the sternum. And I'm talking red marrow, not yellow. From the sternum and the pelvis. And what they do is, it looks like something you could buy at Lowe's. They, they poke it into the... They, they, first, they use a needle to puncture into the skin. And then they take this screw and they put it down into the skin. And they twist and twist and twist onto the uh, hip bone. And they actually do this. They use a local anesthesia, but the patient is awake. Kind of... I never had one, but I've heard it's like, you know how you're at the dentist and it doesn't hurt their drilling on your teeth, but you can like feel the vibrations. You know they're drilling on your teeth. It's like that. But they do that so if you lose feeling in your legs, because that sciatic nerve is right there, you don't want to damage that. Uh, but you can get stem cells there. And I, I really suggest in your spare time, you could watch the um, the extraction of the stem cells. But I, take some time and read about stem cells. I just, uh, I think they're so interesting. We just, this isn't a course on stem cells. Okay, different kinds of fractures. And this is probably what we call a stress fracture. Um, so fracture that occurs from less than standing height, a sign of low bone density. Um, what could you do? Exercise, take calcium and vitamin D supplements. Smoking actually makes your bones thinner. Okay, now we're going to get into the, the bones, the skeletal system. So you got about you have about, roughly about, two hundred and six bones in the body. That's perfect normal. Um, but some people have an extra one and you can see the extra one in the skull right there. This this little piece right there. Oops, that should be purple. It shouldn't be there. So uh, that would be a it says a sutural bone, so Sutural bones uh, are small sesamoid, that means round bones, in tendons to reduce friction. So how like this, you got 206, but some people have extras, or less than extras. Okay, table here. Definitely, definitely, definitely want to spend some time memorizing the term and the definition. You don't have to memorize the example. Now what I did was I put a quiz in, it's 20 questions, it's matching, and you don't have to use respondents, so yes, you could use this table and make a perfect score on the quiz the first time, and it'd be over, but that's not going to help you on the test. This table is on the test. Also, this table is going to help you learn the bones. So, for example, the occipital condyle is a rounded process, looking at the first one, it's a rounded process on the occipital bone. So when you go to learn the bone markings, if you know this table, it's really going to help. And so what I did for this quiz was I set it up where you could take it an unlimited amount of times. You can take it over and over and over and over for practice. And it'll take the high score, so make sure on one of them you make a 20 out of 20. And you can just practice this table over and over and over. And that should be a pretty easy 20 out of 20 for everyone. You can memorize these 20 definitions. You've been doing it since first grade. All you have to know is the term and the definition. Not the example, but it's, I mean, it's word for word matching on the quiz. Okay, so the axial portion, that's the orange portion on the picture. It's the skull the ears, the bones in the ears. The hyoid bone, the hyoid is like right up under the jaw. The vertebra and the ribs. So notice that the arms and legs are called the appendicular skeleton. Now one thing I want to point out, the shoulder girdle and the pelvic girdle, those are in the appendicular. So they're kind of like the gray area. But so you can see right here, that's your scapula, and that's your hip bones, coxal bones, pelvic bones, whatever. Uh, so they are in appendicular. Okay, the skull's got 22 bones. All skull bones are interlocked with sutures. Skull bones are interlocked with sutures except the mandible. So you want to know that the mandible is a skull bone. The mandible is your jaw. It moves up and down. 
The skull is the cranium plus the facial skeleton. Okay, the cranium has eight bones, and that's what encloses and protects the brain. The 14 bones of the face make the shape of the face. Okay, so we're looking at the skull. You see all the different colors. Those are all different bones. The orbit of the eye contains both cranial and facial bones. So the, um, the, the one on the top here would be would be a frontal bone, so it would be cranial, while the the like the green and yellow would be cra uh, would be facial bones. And I always put this in there about the sinuses. How neat! The sinuses are where the bones are hollow, and the purpose is to make your head lighter, so your head's not so heavy. But unfortunately, sometimes we get dust particles and bacteria and mucus built up, and it they cause us more problems than they're worth. I wonder if having a heavy head would be better. Anyway, so um, there's your sinuses there. Okay, looking at the cranium. So the first one is going to be the frontal bone. That's like your forehead bone. It's on the front. Frontal forehead. Uh, it's got the roof of the nasal cavity. So it all the way down to the roof of the nasal cavity. Roofs of the eye orbit. It's got the frontal sinus, okay, the supraorbital foramen is a teeny tiny hole right there, you can see, and um, so as we go through this, I'm going to try to point out some things that are on the lab test also, but this PowerPoint is designed for the lecture test, so I might say uh, which of the following is, is true about the frontal bone, and uh, one of the choices may say it's got a supraorbital foramen. If you study that table, which I hope you are, you'll learn that a foramen is a small opening for nerves and blood vessels to pass through. So it's a pretty important one. Okay, the parietal bones, those are, there's two of them. They're purple on the picture. There's two of them right on top. Sides of the roof of the cranium. In between them is the sagittal suture. And the back of them has the coronal suture. Now, a suture is where the bones interlock, like a puzzle piece. And so, down the middle of that parietal bone is a suture. There's two of them. And it's called a sagittal suture. So, the sagittal suture is right here. And then the coronal suture is right here in the very front of it. So, think about where you would wear your crown. That's your coronal suture. Sagittal is right down the middle. Okay, the occipital bone, that's that pretty turquoise one in the back. And you can see it's turquoise right here too, so it's this back one. Okay, the, the occipital bone is the back of the skull, the base of the cranium. It's got this big hole in it. You see the big hole called foramen magnum. It's got occipital condyles, and that's going to be uh, these little bumps right here. And the occipital condyles, what they do, they touch the vertebra. The foramen magnum, you probably knew this, but that's where the spinal cord comes out. That's where the brain comes out, and it's the spinal cord. So the brain and spinal cord are all attached. Uh, lamboid suture, so it's got this, if you look back at this last picture, right here is the lamboid suture. Posterior bone of the cranium joins the parietal bones anteriorly. So, so far we've looked at, I think this picture is a little bit better. So far we've looked at the frontal bone, the parietal bone, and the occipital bone. Okay, sutures that we've looked at, let's go with red. This is your coronal suture. Right here, in between the parietal bones, is the sagittal suture. And this one is lamboid suture. So we've looked at three sutures and, you know, the bones. There's two parietal bones, only one frontal and one occipital. Okay, the foramen magnum is the large opening um, where the spine comes out. We talked about that. That's in the occipital bone. Occipital condyles, that's where the dots are, and they actually touch the vertebra. So they touch the vertebra. The sphenoid bone, we haven't talked about that one yet, is a butterfly-shaped bone. Uh, it's got the cella tertia, or turk saddle, and that's where the pituitary gland is. Okay, let me see if I can find a picture of that.
Okay, look right there at the pink one. That is the sphenoid bone, but it, go, it goes inside. It's on either side of your head, and inside there, that's where the pituitary gland sits. So make sure and highlight that. And I just noticed it's in a, another part of the PowerPoint, too. So sphenoid bone, you want to highlight that's where the cella tertia or turk saddle is. So that's what holds the pituitary gland, which releases the growth hormone to make the bones grow. Okay, foramen as a whole. So the jugular foramen allows the passage of the, the jugular vein. And so that's going to be uh, underneath the skull. Look at this picture right here. You can see it. So the jugular foramen right here is that hole. Oops, let's do purple. And that, there's a vein that runs right through there, and it carries the the blood from the brain back to the heart. So it's a pretty important it's a pretty important hole. Um, let's go ahead and go over the carotid canal. Also, it is. So I'm gonna highlight the word. And then you're going to see it right there, that little hole right there. So the jugular foramen is a little bit bigger than the carotid canal is. The carotid canal takes the blood to the brain. The artery does. Okay, the temporal bones, that's going to be the red, the red bone uh, on the picture. The sides and base of the cranium orbits the eye. Uh, it's got around it, that suture is called... The squamous suture, so right, let's go with purple, right here. That suture, remember suture is where bones connect. Uh, external acoustic meatus, that's the ear hole. Mandibular fossa, that's going to be, it's like flat right here, where the, this is the mandible fits in. Mastoid process, it's got this big hump on the back. Humpty Humpty, see Humpty Dumpty, that big bump on the back. You can feel your um, mandibular process on the back. Okay, styloid process, that's that pointy thing. I always think about a styloid like that you would use on an iPad. I use my index finger. That's why my writing is so in interesting. Anyway, styloid is pointy like that. Zygomatic process, that is, let's erase all this. On the red bone where it comes out right there, that's the style. That's the zygomatic process, and then where it see it, that green bone is the zygomatic bone. So where the temporal bone and the zygomatic bone connect, that's going to be the zygomatic arch. Okay, the mastoid process. That's that bump on the back. I just showed it to you. A rough projection, it's got air cavities, it's got sinuses, mastoid sinuses, high risk spots for infection. Okay, but that's where this muscle attached. Um, the, you, your sternum is the bone right in the middle. The mastoid process and the sternum are connected with the sternoclidium mastoid muscle. So that's really neat. And then all three of those muscles attach there to that bone. And we'll talk more about the muscles on the next chapter. Okay, so the sphenoid bone. It's that hot pink one we already talked about. That's got the, you already highlighted this, but maybe do it again. It's got the cella tertica in it. That's where the pituitary gland sits. Okay, the ethmoid bone. Oops, there we go. Um, the ethmoid bone, you can see inside the eye is purple. So it's in the very, very center of the eye on either side of the nose. Anterior portion of the cranium, if you take it out, it looks like a butterfly. Look at the bone taken out of the head. Part of the medial surface of the orbit contains cavities or sinuses. Okay, highlight, it's got the Cristagala on it. Attaches, and that's what the brain attaches to. And so, if you're looking at it outside, it's right here too. If you look at it up under the skull, so if you could take the parietal bones off of the skull, that's what you would see right there. And that little pointy projection, the cristagala, that's where the covering of the brain sits. So, I might say something, you know, the ethmoid, you want to know that the ethmoid bone has the cristagala and that that's where the brain attaches. Okay, this slide just goes over the sutures. Remember, we'll review them real quick with our pen. 
We've got the coronal suture. That's where you would wear your crown if you wore a crown. We got the sagittal suture, which is in between the parietal bones. We got the squamous suture, which is around the temporal bone. And you've got the lamboid suture, which is the occipital bone. So take a second and review those sutures. That's where the, the plates of the cranium form together. Okay, this is your jawbone. The maxillary bone be your upper jaw like where if you had a mustache it'd be where your mustache was so the um, the yellow bone upper jaw the roof of the mouth the floors of the orbits so the bottom of the eye nasal cavity okay but here's what I want you to write in it's got um, it's got a little bit hole the sinus and the, the palatine process on it but here's what I want you to write in I want you to write in that the maxillary is part of the facial skeleton. Okay, the palatine bone. That's going to be the palate of your mouth, right? L-shaped bones located behind the maxilla, so behind your front teeth posterior section of the hard palate, floor and lateral walls of the nasal cavity. Okay, the zygomatic bone, we already looked at it. It's the green one, right? Uh, that's what, that's what, if you put blush on, that, sorry guys, I can't relate to you, but blush, that's where you put your blush on. You want your zygomatic bone to have that uh, prominent appearance. So, uh, prominence of the cheeks, lateral walls and floors of orbits, um, you've got on the zygomatic bone, it pokes out. There's a temporal process. Uh, lacrimal bones. It looks like it's almost like a gray color. It's right behind um, the yellow, the maxilla bone, in the eye. Medial walls of orbits. Is, it would be like right at the very, very center. Like where your tear ducts would be. And then the nasal bone is the green color on the front. That's your nose. That should be an easy one to get. Okay, the vomer is uh, the very middle of the nose, so it's like where your nose goes up in between your nostrils, along the midline of the nasal cavity. So I was trying to see it in the picture. Let's see what color it is. If you look back a couple slides, it's right there. It's that hot pink one. So the vomer is, it's got that line down the middle of it. So the maxillary, that's where your mustache was, if you had a mustache. Now, I want to point out something about the maxillary bone. A cleft palate or cleft lip is the failure of that palate to form together. And um, I know they make special nipples for uh, babies that have a cleft palate. The nipples are really long that go back to the back of the mouth so they can drink the milk or whatever, eat. Um, but numerous surgeries, they have to do it as the the face continues to develop but numerous surgeries can fix a cleft palate where that bone doesn't go together okay the mandible that's the jaw bone the part that opens and closes uh, largest and strongest bone of the face okay the hyoid bone the head is by far the far the hardest I mean it is by far the hardest so now we'll start um, moving a little faster so it'll be easier. The hyoid bone is below the mandible. It looks like a little horseshoe. Uh, it doesn't touch any other bones. It's actually held there with ligaments and tendons. It says does not articulate with any other bone, but it does support the tongue. Okay, here's your rib cage. Uh, you got 12 pairs. Of uh, the ribs are attached, so twelve pairs of ribs are attached. So we call those true ribs. Okay, the 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 seven true, the upper seven pairs are true ribs, um, and they go from the spinal cord to the sternum. So they go all the way around. So if you look at this picture, they go from this is your sternum right here. That I do purple. That's your sternum bone. So they go from the front all the way to the back. Okay, five pairs are what we call false ribs. And so if you look at the picture closely, they go from the back 
and then they connect up front to this cartilage right here. So right there, how they connect into the cartilage. There they are. That's the five of them. Um, but they go, so the the false ribs connect from the spinal cord, but then they connect to cartilage, the coastal cartilage. And then the last two are floating ribs, and they don't have any cartilage. They don't attach. So if you look at the picture, you can kind of see it's numbered 11 and 12 where they uh, float. Okay, let me, you want to know a lot about this slide. So I'm going to ask you, you may even see that picture on the test. May even see that picture on the test. Okay, so I might ask you a question. How many of the ribs are true? Okay, then you would choose seven. I might ask you a question like, how many, uh, no, there's seven true ribs, but what is a true rib? It connects from the sternum to the vertebra, so attached directly to the sternum. They all connect to the vertebra, so that's not on there. Um, what is a floating rib? Well, they're not attached to the sternum at all. Not by cartilage, not by anything. They're just floating. And men and women do have the same amount of ribs, contrary to popular belief. Okay, on that sternum, so the sternum is that long, flat piece in the middle. Uh, flat, elongated bone, and it's got, if you look at it, okay, the very top, is the manubrium, then you've got the middle part is the body, and then the bottom part is the xiphoid process. So you may see this picture on the test. So the whole thing, whole thing, is the sternum, the top, manubrium, and I've also heard that pronounced manubrium. So either way, the body is the middle, and then the xiphoid process is that little part on the end. A biopsy of red marrow may be made by sternal puncture. We already looked at that. So, but um, let's highlight it again because I believe it, it could be on the test. Sternum puncture is how you can get red marrow. Uh, and make sure you've got all three of those. You may have to match those to the picture. So, Manubrium, body, xiphoid process, that's the sternum, all three. Okay, your ver your vertebra, you have, they're in different sizes, and they go from smallest to largest. So the seven at the top are cervical, and the cervical vertebra are smaller. Okay, um, the, and th they're a little bit different. The cervical, the cervical vertebra have these holes on either side that we'll look at on the lab test called transverse foramen. Anyway, there's 12 thoracic, and then the lumbar, there's five, and they're the biggest ones. The lumbar are the five biggest ones. So you got seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, and then the sacrum is this little curved under part at the bottom. Uh, and it says uh, the sacrum is five that are fused together. So it appears as one. And then the coccyx, that would be like your tailbone. I know you've heard of people that break that. So before birth, there's actually 33, but the sacrum and the coccyx fuse together. But you want to know those numbers, 7, 12, and 5. So cervical, thoracic, lumbar. 7 small cervical, 12 medium thoracic, medium in size, and then 5 big Lumbar. So the lumbar ones are the big ones. There it is in a nice table for you. Okay, the intervertebral disc. They are, they're in between the bones. So the vertebra obviously are not connected. I mean, they're, they're, there's a pad in between them. Think about it like a, a gummy, a lifesaver gummy under, in between them. Pad of flexible cartilage. It cushions the vertebra. It absorbs shock, so when you jump, it's not bone touching bone. It's bone with a squishy pad in between it. But it allows for bending, so intervertebral disc, which you know a little bit about. Okay, talking about the curves, you can see this in the picture. Um, primary curvature present at birth, so you've got the thoracic curve, which is right in the middle, and the sacral curve present at birth. But then, uh, when the baby when starts to hold their head up, they get that cervical curvature, so you can see it curving. And then the lumbar curvature 
at the bo at the bottom, so right above the sacral. So you can see when the baby starts to walk, they get the lumbar curve. And these are just the pieces of the vertebra. So um, the body, that's that big thick part on the bottom. The vertebral foramen, those are holes on either side. That's not in the picture, but it's holes on either side. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I lied. That's the hole right down the middle. So the vertebral foramen is the hole on either side. Transverse foramen would be holes over here, but we don't have any in the picture. Also not on the slide. Okay, spinous process. That's going to be this projection right here. And then the superior and inferior articulating process... That's where the vertebra articulate. Okay, this is disorders of those, of the vertebra curvatures, and you probably heard of a lot of these. That if that intervertebral disc, that squishy lifesaver gummy I told you about, if it were to slide out or even burst, um, that would be the first one. So break in the outer portion of the intervertebral disc. So what happens if it's gone? There's going to be bone compressing with bone. Very very painful. Kyphosis, okay, I like that one for sure. Oh. Exaggerated thoracic curvature. So you want to know that it's in the thoracic. Exaggerated thoracic curvature of the spine. Rounded shoulders and hunchbacked. So poor posture is caused by poor posture, uh, injury, or disease. So we want to focus on that one, kyphosis. Scoliosis, we know what that is because we've been tested for it. Um, abnormal lateral, so sideways. Lordosis is in the lumbar, so highlight that one. Lumbar curvature of the spine. And then a compression fracture may be where the body of the, the vertebra is fractured. Okay, so the cervical vertebra have those transverse foramen. Highlight that. I said it before, but let's highlight it here. Transverse foramen. Okay, the first cervical is called the atlas. And it looks different than all the other ones. So it's on the right, it's on, it's on the top. So it's, it's, a fl it's flat. Uh, all the cervical ones have transverse foramen. Only the cervical have transverse foramen. But the top one, you can see, it it's like flat in those... It has. It says the first vertebra. It doesn't have a body, but it touches the occipital condyle. So look right here at these dips right here. These two little dips. They touch that occipital bone, the backbone of the skull. So it articulates with articulates. It touches that. So the atlas is a cervical vertebra, the very top one. But I have that written in for some reason. So atlas, make sure that you know, is a cervical vertebra. Okay, the axis is the second vertebra. It's like we number them C1, C2. So this one is C2. And it's got this little humpty humpty on it. Whoops. So see, look at it from the side. The side view, it's got this little, see that little humpty dumpty right there? Um... So the, the both of these are axis. This one is atlas. This one is axis. But if you're looking at it, I wasn't too good at writing, was it? Anyway, if you're looking at it, it's got this little part that pokes out, and that is called an odontoid process or dens. And if if you're gonna write this on the lab test, you might as well write dens because it's a lot easier to spell. But that's a pivot point. That's how you can turn your head. And so the dens of the atlas fits up in the, of the axis fits up in the atlas, so, so you can rotate your head. Okay, the 12th thoracic, uh, they're larger than cervical. The spinous process is long and skinny. Some people say it looks like a giraffe. And it hooks uh, sharply downward. Okay, the lumbar, those are the big ones. They support the weight of the upper body. Uh, they've got a big body. They have a, the spinous process is short and thick. So the thoracic have a long spinous process. The thoracic have a long spinous process. The lumbar have a short, thick one. And their body is really big, the lumbar. 
Okay, the coccyx. That's your tailbone. Uh, fusion of four small vertebra. So you want to know that number. Uh, that's the human tailbone. Uh, the sacrum is five. So the, the coccyx is four and the sacrum is five. And that's the back of your pelvic is the sacrum. Okay. Pectoral. For some reason, students get confused. Pectoral is your shoulder girdle. Pelvic is your hip girdle. So here's your pectoral girdle and all that it consists of. It consists of the clavicle, it consists of the scapula, and it consists of the humerus. So it's got three bones there. I'm sorry, they're not considering the humerus part of the pectoral girdle. So clavicle and scapula. Okay, the clavicle or the collarbone. There's the information on that. Slender, doubly curved, so it, it's curved a little bit here and a little bit here. Attaches to the manubrium of the sternum. So here's the manubrium of the sternum. It attaches there. And it also attaches to the scapula, which is here. It acts as a brace. I broke my clavicle one time. Okay, in a car wreck. The scapula here. A flat body with three important features. Okay, so they're talking about the scapula. That's that backbone. Okay, if you're looking at it, and this is really for lab, here's the spine. The acromion process comes out right there. So the acromion process is connected to the spine. The other one right here, or right here, is the coracoid process. And then the cava, you want to know, highlight that. That's what I'm going to ask you on the test, on the multiple choice test. The glenoid cavity, that's the socket. So the pectoral shoulder, pectoral socket is the glenoid cavity. Okay, upper limbs of the bone. Um, you got your, so this is the arm bone, right? Framework of the upper arm. You got your forearm and hand, so the whole arm. Humerus is at the top, that's the top bone. Humerus. Radius and ulna is the lower bones. And you can remember the radius is on the thumb side. The ulna is on the pinky side if you're in anatomical position. Metacarpals, carpals, here we go, look. You got carpals right here, metacarpals right here, and then the phalanges are on the bottom. Okay, all about the humerus. Okay, this. so looking at the humerus, funny bone right top of the arm, Greater and lesser tubercles, those are going to be at the top. So look at the top. Uh, there's a greater and a lesser bump, a big bump and a little bump. And let me point out that these are both right arm bones. So this is the front on the left-hand side and the back on the right-hand side. That's the way the book did it. So they're both right bones, right arm bones, not a right and a left. Okay, the deltoid tuberosity, that's in the middle of the... Humerus, that's that bump right in the middle, right there. See that little bump right there? Okay, uh, at the distal end, you got medial trochlea and lateral capitulum. So you can see those on the distal end. And those touch, articulate with the bones of the forearm. Okay, above the trochlea anteriorly, on the front, you got this depression called a coronoid fossa. Fossa means flat, right? You learned that in the table. Okay, and then on the back is the olecranon fossa, and it's big. So you got a little one and a big one. The little one is on the front anterior, and the big one is on the back. 
the olecranon fossa and the coracoid fossa allow the lower arm bone, the ulna, looks like an ice cream scoop, we'll see in a second, to move and it, it opens up and inside it. Okay, the forearm has the the radius, which is lateral. You want to know that. The radius in in anatomical position is lateral. Uh, and you can see that that's the, the smaller one, the one on the left-hand side. The radial tuberosity is below the head, where the tendon bicep is like a little bump, a humpty hump. Okay, on the bottom, it's got a styloid process right there. Here's your styloid process. They both have a styloid process. So that's really easy. Same word. They look alike. They're on the bottom. That's where the wrists go. And then the ulna, which has the ice cream scoop on it. So you has the ice cream scoop. The ulna, the medial bone when the body is in anatomical position. So we want to know that one's medial. Okay, the wrist. Take a deep breath. If I were you, I'd take a break before this slide and then uh, study it for a minute and then take another break. So this is this one kind of is tricky. Okay, looking at the bones. And there are, it says the hand consists of carpals. So that's going to be the wrist bones. Here, carpals. And then right here, those are metacarpals. And then these are your phalanges. So carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. Now, the carpals are held together with ligaments. Okay, zoom into this picture, maybe on your computer somehow. Look at it. It's scaphoid on the top, the proximal row. Scaphoid, lunate. So I was going to try to point them out to you. Okay, so scaphoid, lunate, Triquetrium is up under pisiform. And then straight down you've got hamate, capitate, trapezoid, trapezium. Now, the way I learned these, and actually my high school anatomy teacher did this, she wrote them on the board. Scaphoid, lunate, scaphoid, lunate, triquetrium, pisiform, hamate, capitate, trapezoid, trapezium. And then she would erect, we would practice it. She would erase one. Oh, I erased a bunch. There we go. She would erase one. She would say, okay, say it again. We'd say scaphoid, lunate, triquetrium, pisiform, hamate, capitate, trapezoid, trapezium. She'd erase another one. We'd say it. She'd erase another one. Would say it. She'd erase another. Anyway, so we get down to not very many. We say scaphoid, lunate, triquetrium, pisiform, bottom row, hamate, capitate, trapezoid, trapezium. So I really learned it just saying it over and over and over. But I've never forgotten it ever since she did that. And so you got to figure out what works for you. But that's what worked for me. And so let me draw it out right here. You got scaphoid, lunate. Triquetrium and then pisiform is really little on top of the trapezium. On top of triquetrium. So scaphoid, lunate, triquetrium, pisiform, and then you come straight down. Hamate, capitate, trapezoid, trapezium. Now, what I'm going to do is you don't have to do this, but in the folder on this module, I'm going to put some extra things that you could do if you wanted to practice. And I have a coloring sheet if, you, if you're visual and you just want to practice. Um, I, okay, let's go over what kind of questions I could ask. On the written test, I could say, which of the following is not a carpal? So I might say scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, or hyoid. And hyoid bone was up by the jaw. Okay, on the lab test, I'm going to use a picture that you see. You'll see the picture. I'm going to use that picture. And you may have to identify it. But luckily, you'll study the picture. So I think that's one advantage of the online class you know, you can study the actual picture that I'm going to give you uh, on the test. So that makes it nice. But you will not have to label on the written test. Okay, and another thing I didn't mention about the wrist bones, the textbook gives a sentence. It's so long top part. Here comes the thumb. So if that sentence helps you to memorize them, use it. Okay, so you got five metacarpals. The thumb would be considered number one. So metacarpal number one, two, three, four, five. 
the fingers, you got on all of them except the thumb, you got a proximal, a medial, and a distal on all of them but the thumb. The thumb only has a proximal and a distal. Students generally get confused on this right here. On the lab test, I'm going to ask you, what is this bone? And you're going to say proximal, I'm, I'm sorry, you're going to say metacarpal number one. This is proximal phalange, and this is distal phalange. So there's not a medial, a middle phalange on the, um, the thumb. Pelvic, okay, pelvic girdle consists of two coxal bones, um, the, so the two hip bones, pelvic, pelvic girdle, the sacrum, and the coccyx all make up the pelvic girdle. Okay, the hip bones, there's actually three of them. So highlight this. You've got the ilium, oop, which is that tan part. You've got the ischium, which is that hideous green color. And then you've got the pubis, which is that, um, I don't know, coral color. So ilium, ischium, pubis. So those are the three bones that make up the hip bones. Elium ischium pubis. Elium ischium pubis. Okay. So that's what I'm going to ask you on the test. What are the three bones that make up the hip? And then the the bone markings we're going to go over on lab, lab lecture. Okay. Acetabulum is, that's the joint. So glenoid was the joint for the pectoral. For the pelvic, the glen, the, the joint is the acetabulum. So that's this right here. That's the acetabulum. Mm -hmm. Okay, the pelvic the pelvic outlet is actually measured to make sure the baby head can go through the, on the females, right? No, I'm just kidding. But really, to make sure that the baby can fit through. Um, if the dimensions are not adequate, they may have to have a cesarean, which is, well, you know what a C-section is. So, um... Interesting enough, probably you could figure it out. Women have wider pelvic bones than men do. Okay, so there's a female pelvis, there's a male pelvis, and you can see the differences. So that's interesting. Okay, so there's your lower legs. You've got your, we're going to go over them together. you got your femur. Okay, the patella is the knee bone. Isn't that a cute word, patella? Okay, the tibia is the big bone, and the it's the larger of the bones that, of the lower leg. The femur is the largest bone in the body. The tibia is the larger one on the lower leg, and then the smaller one that's lateral is the fibula. I see. I hear students all the time say, "tib," it's tibia and fibula. Then you've got ankle bones are called tarsals metatarsals, phalanges. So femur, patella, you got the tibia and fibula. Fibula is small. Think about you told a little fib. Tarsals, metatarsals, phalanges. Femur, largest, longest, strongest, biggest bone of the body. Okay, the head of it fits into that. We already know that joint is called the acetabulum. Okay, fovea capitis. Highlight this. That's a little opening. You see it on the very tip top right there. A little bitty opening uh, on the head of the femur. And that's where the ligament attaches. Like a little indention. Okay, the neck, a lot of times people will break that. They'll fall and break the... They'll have to have hip replacement surgery. But what they really broke was their femur. The head of the femur broke. Uh, lesser and greater trochanter, so that's on the top. So take a second, kind of pause the video. Remember, the femur has the greater and lesser trochanters. Those are big. Trochanters are big. The humerus, which was the upper arm bone, it had two similar bumps, but they were tubercles. So the femur has the big trochanters and the humerus has small 
tubercles. So kind of don't get those confused. Students have a hard time with that. Um, so and then on the bottom, on the lateral end, on the distal end, sorry, there's lateral and medial condyles. So trochanters on the top, condyles on the bottom. Okay, highlight this last part, the lateral and medial condyles. That's what articulates, touches, meets with the tibia. So I may ask you, where's the medial condyle? And you're going to say, oh, it's on the femur. Remember that. The femur has the medial condyle. Okay, next we've got the patellar surface. That's where the patella or the knee bone sits. And then the lower leg has the tibia and fibula. Okay, the tibia, highlight this, uh, bears the weight of the body. It's, it's like what your shin bone is. Tibial tuberosity is a roughened area on the anterior surface. So you'll see it right here. Uh, and that's where the patella ligament attaches. The distal end articulates with the ankle bones or the talus. So the, ta the talus is one of the ankle bones. It's a, the talus is a tarsal. Uh, and then the distal has the medial and lateral malus. Okay, so look right here. You can see on the tibia is the medial malus. Tibia medial. Tibia medial. Okay, the fibula oh, has the lateral malus. So get those. Tibia has medial. Fibula just happens to have an L, has the lateral one. Fibula is lateral. Okay. And we're going to go ahead and highlight that. Good. Okay. Tarsals, that's your ankle bones, just like the hand. Metatarsals, and then the phalanges. So the phalanges are the toes. They support the weight of the body. They serve as a lever so that you can move your ankle point and flex and point and flex. Okay, seven tarsal bones. For some reason, these aren't as hard as the wrist bones. But there's still a lot of them. So there's seven of them. Look, I'm going to give you the picture on the lab exam uh, recording. I'm going to give you the exact picture I'm going to use on the lab exam. So those are your um, ankle bones. The sentence from the book is, Cal told Nora... And then medial, intermedial, lateral. Milk is like cream. Okay, so you've got calcaneus at the top. The talus is the one that the tibia touches. And then that long skinny one is navicular. And then you've got these three right here. Medial, intermedial, and lateral cuneiforms intermediate and lateral cuneiforms. And then the last one, I didn't put one out there, did I? It's cuboid. And that one's kind of big and square, so it makes sense. So pause the video and practice that a couple times. Okay, the talus, it actually articulates with the tibia and fibula. Uh, the calcaneus, however, is the largest one. So it's located below it. So the talus kind of sits on the calcaneus. Okay, metatarsals, J just like the metacarpals, these are tarsals of the feet, and they're numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, the bones in the foot are arranged to form three strong arches, two longitudinal, medial and lateral, extend from the heel to the toe, and then one transverse stretches across the foot, and if it's fallen, it makes like a flat foot. Okay, you got 14 phalanges, three for each, so proximal, medial, distal, except the big toe. The book calls it the great toe, but I call it the big toe. So proximal, medial, distal on those. Okay, different kinds of fractures. A simple or closed fracture um, would just be like a crack. And then a compound fracture, fracture in which 
uh, the bone is exposed so it comes out of the skin ouch comes all the way out here's a picture of these okay some two I want you to highlight for sure a green stick fracture is it incomplete and the break occurs on the convex surface of uh, convex surface of the bend in the bone so this reminds me of like I don't know people going talking about getting a whooping with a, a hickory stick you know how sticks from outside they don't break if they're still if they still have moisture in them so green stick fracture I don't know why it just makes me think of that and then another one I want you to highlight is the commuted fracture and that's where it's is broken into lots of pieces so commuted fracture has fragments so you may see both of those on the multiple choice part. Okay, steps to fix, uh, steps to fix the a repair, repair a bone. Okay, you want to know these in order. Hematoma forms. That's a blood clot. The cartilage. Uh, it says phagocytes. Those are white blood cells that remove. They eat like Pac-Man. Phagocytes remove the debris, the fiber cartilage, and then bony callus osteoblast form invade hard callus fill space and then it starts to remodel so make sure that you know um, those those four in order of how to um, repair a fracture alright that was the end of a long lecture on the skeletal system uh, and and really I think you should study this lecture with the lab lecture uh, kinda together before you take both tests because I think that will be the most beneficial for you but good luck and let me know if there's anything I can do to help you